but I always feel better for the arrival of the CapEx email in, and um, I'm always, always stimulated, provoked, intrigued, better informed, and while I don't always agree with everything that CapEx writes, I would definitely recommend to everyone here that you subscribe. Um, as email digests of opinion go, it's up there with the best. Well, uh, doing my job for me, but um, <laughs> your, your, your day job, apart from uh, shilling for CapEx, is, is as uh, Secretary of State for Leveling Up Housing um, and Communities. And I'm, I wanted to start by asking, you are now, I think, the longest serving member of the Cabinet, and you sort of, by, by common consent, one of the ones who's had the most impact in, in, his, in his various jobs. I mean, whether you agree with what you've done or not, mm. and, and lo there are lots of people on either side in all of the jobs you've done, yeah, actually, yeah. It's, it's def you're generally reckoned to have been sort of one of the most effective ministers. I wanted to, ask, to start by asking, if you could travel back in time to the, the, the Michael Gove of 2010, mm. what would you tell him about, what advice would you give him about, about running a department, being a minister, about getting well, things, things done in politics? Well, it, it's very flattering. Um, and longevity doesn't necessarily uh, mean effectiveness. Um, uh, but I have been fortunate to have been there, like Jeremy and Grant, um, in government uh, in 2010, and then obviously out at certain points. It's difficult to distill lessons that apply universally um, because uh, each minister, each team will have a different style. But, but I, if I were to distill it into a few points, the first thing is it's always later than you think. So uh, you mustn't muck around. Um, when I was in the Department for Education, we had some time in opposition to consider what it is that we wanted to do, and we came in with a plan. As you say, people might um, uh, think what we did was terrible or might think it was wonderful or something in between. But we did drive change. We're on the wonderful side. Thank you. And then um, in subsequent departments, I took a little bit of time to work out what I consider to be the most important uh, uh, challenge, informed, of course, by what the Prime Minister of the day had said when I was sent to that department they thought was important. Um, and then uh, it was important to prioritise. Um, Prioritisation is not simply a list. It's also uh, a, uh, an argument. So it's not enough simply to say, I will do A, B, and C. They have to hang together in an overall story. So again, just to go to education, the critical thing there was uh, I, I was obsessed with two things. One, making sure that we could um, uh, end our reverse uh, or our slide down international league tables, so raise the level of ambition in our school system and close the gap between rich and poor. So uh, uh, raising the bar and narrowing the gap. And within that, my argument was that you achieve a greater degree of social justice and opportunity by doing conservative things, by uh, giving parents choice, by insisting um, on discipline and rigor, and so on. Then subsequently, uh, at uh, Justice, the thing I thought there was, I wasn't there for long, that the single most important thing that you could do was to reform the prison system because the, the cost, not just to the uh, lives of others uh, when crime is committed, but the cost to individuals themselves who were caught up in the criminal just, justice system was indefensible. Um, and in each government department, I, I, I had a, a story to tell. People use the word narrative. It's overused. I think it, it's actually better to say an argument. Uh, we should be changing from X to Y. This is the justification and reason and purpose for that. Um, and then there are a few other things that I would say. Um, one is... Um, uh, it, it's always important, and this is linked to the argument point, to think in ink. So uh, by that I mean you've got to be able to write an article, make a speech, have others distill what you're doing in a way that is um, an intelligible argument, um, slogans um, or PowerPoint presentations are only effective, and PowerPoint presentations are very rarely effective, if they're the distillation of an argument that can be made as part of a continuous piece of prose. So thinking in ink. Um, and then uh, one other thing, and I could go on, but one other thing is when you look at any system, um, the principle, and this is a, um, a phrase that I borrowed from my friend Paul Marshall, show me the incentives and I will show you the behavior. And you can go back to thinkers like Julian Legrand and others. Um, there are lots of people operating with noble motives in the public and the private sector. But you have to look at the incentives in the system to understand why the high hopes often vested in that system don't necessarily lead to the results that you want. So you're in your current role, um, I'd say you, you, mm. you, you, you may correct me on this, but it feels like you have two priorities, mm. um, levelling up and, and housing. Yeah. Um, and it, to, to be 
controversial, it feels like like neither of them is in the best place it could be. Um, we are mm. it, we arrive here in the middle of a row over whether the sort of totemic yes. leveling up project HS2 is going to mm. be be lopped off. The, mm. ho the housing system is in a is in a pretty desperate mm. desperate state. So I mean, what has has something gone wrong with your mission, or have you? No, I th well, I think in both cases. You're dealing with deep-rooted problems, so you need long-term solutions. So um, I outlined our uh, approach towards housing in, 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 in a pretty comprehensive, but there's still you know, one or two additional bits that needed to be filled that way in July, and explained why, if you're dealing with the problems in our housing market, you need to take a long-term approach. So uh, one small bit of that was thinking about that part of the country where we most need to encourage development, both economic and housing, Cambridge, Greater Cambridge. Um, and I explained what, what it was that we could do there. And I also put it in the context of how you uh, derive the most economic and environmental benefit from new housing and argued for uh, densification. I also think that one of the reasons why we have a, a, a housing challenges is because uh, but some of those who are most pro-development haven't always appreciated why there has been resistance to development. I exempt the CPS totally from that charge, but there are some who have, I think, in their zeal to hit numbers and housing targets, which is admirable, um, ignored some of the worries that people have about the quality of new housing, in particular beauty. And people um, haven't always uh, leveled with communities about um, uh, uh, how infrastructure is going to be paid for. Uh, people haven't always taken account of the environmental externalities of, of house building and the environmental concerns that people have. So as well as being ambitious, you also need to be empathetic on leveling up. We made it clear in our white paper that this was a long-term challenge because the, the economic inequality between uh, London and the Southeast and the other parts of the United Kingdom is something that's been embedded for a long time won't be uh, solved or resolved overnight. Um, and again, one of the arguments in the white paper with which people can take issue is that there is no silver bullet. So traditionally, the Treasury have tended to say that uh, the answer to levelling up has been purely human capital. Others have argued that infrastructure is the most important thing. I think that you need to look at them in the round because uh, you know, there, is, there is no single ingredient. Mm -hmm. And we used a, um, a metaphor from history, the Medici model. Some people might regard that as, uh, uh, you know, what's the word, um, absurdly arch and uh, uh, you know, what has Renaissance Italy got to teach us about life in Manchester in the 21st century. But the key thing there is that if cities flourish, it's not just about infrastructure, it's not just about the private sector, it's about culture and beauty, it's about civic involvement and democracy as well. But you, so to drill down in, into those two specifically, mm. you, said, you said there's no silver bullets, but there, there was going to be a silver bullet train. Um, what, so what <laughs> is happening? <laughs> well, sorry. No, 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 it's fair. And everyone wants to know um, what's going to happen with HS2, but um, every cabinet minister will tell you um, two things. One, the project is going on. Two, we have to secure the maximum value for money. And uh, the Prime Minister and uh, the rest of us uh, will say more in due course. Uh, everyone will try to uh, uh, tease out of us um, more than that. Uh, but we, in this conference, will be clear that uh, every transport project has to be scrutinized for value for money. And again, my not pushback, but qualification is, if you're thinking about uh, transport overall, yes, north-south links are important, but so are east-west, and so critically also are transport links within city regions. So one of the strengths that Manchester has is the integrated transport network, the B network that's been established. One of the weaknesses that Leeds have, has, and it's no fault of any particular individual, is that it's the largest city in Europe without an effective um, you know, metro system. Um, and uh, Leeds has significant advantages, but that's probably the single most important thing you could do to connect um, all of the uh, different communities and enterprises within Leeds. But, but, but as on, on Cambridge, I suppose the question is, mm. the, we, we, we are going to have an election within the, a, a year, a year and a half. Or mm. so. uh, how, how much can you realistically do? I mean, ha, are there going to be spades in the, in the ground on, on those projects? Well, there are already in HS2. And I think the other thing is, um, uh, there's, a, uh, of course, an electoral timetable in people's minds. But my hunch, and I could be proven wrong, is if people see that you are taking the right long-term decisions overall, 
um, and they might disagree with individual um, you know, uh, choices that you've made. But if they see that you're taking the right long-term decisions overall um, uh, uh, and you're thinking and acting in the national interest, they will trust you with government. Uh, and therefore, um, it's not going to be the case that in the next uh, 12 to 18 months that we're going to see thousands of new homes uh, in Cambridge, well actually we will see hundreds of new homes, but not thousands of new homes in Cambridge itself. But what you will see is the establishment of the infrastructure to do that, the uh, creation of the means to do that, the delivery body, the if necessary secondary legislation and so on. So people will see that, that serious steps are being taken. So on housing, and apologies if you're not a housing nerd, this might be a bit complicated, but we have in, in, the, mm. in England, certainly, I mean, a, a plan-led system. The yes. idea is that local councils are meant to say, this is mm. where you can build and this is where you can't build. Yes. That system is essentially broken at this point. Yes. Um, 40, last year, 14 councils mm. um, put forward local plans that I think mm. the, you know, you know, the estimate from the LPDF is that by 2025, 78% mm. of councils won't have a plan in place. And that's partly because of all the political convulsions mm. around planning policy. People have just not, mm. not be putting the plans in place. So we, so on top of which you have interest rate rises and a, and a collapse in the market. Like yes. This is a really serious situation. So yes. we, what certainty is the, is the government able to offer? I mean, you know, just well, to take your second point first, um, the only way that you can bring interest rates down and with it the cost of mortgages and the cost of renting is by uh, dealing with inflation. I won't weary this audience with um, the steps that we've taken and the arguments that have been made by the Prime Minister and, and by Jeremy, with which I agree. That is the single most important thing. And we've had situations in the past when interest rates have risen and actually they've done more havoc, created more havoc in uh, housing markets than uh, the trouble that we've experienced recently because of that. Uh, I can run through why this is a global phenomenon and why other, uh, in particular, but not exclusively English-speaking countries, are facing uh, uh, similar storms. It's a real problem, uh, but we're gripping it. On planning, I think you're absolutely right. One of our big problems has been that lots of local authorities haven't adopted plans. Um, and... Uh, and, but, but, but there used to be sticks that made them adopt plans. Oh, there, there and, are. And we've kind of snapped the sticks. No, I don't think so. So the biggest stick yeah, is... So your uh, jacket is just... Oh, uh, oh right. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. The biggest stick is, um, and again, forgive me for getting technical. I'm sure everyone in this audience understands playing policy. The biggest stick is the tilted balance. What? So if you are a council leader, let's imagine that you are the chief executive or the leader of Lionshire. Um, and you say, do you know what? Don't want any houses, therefore I won't have a plan. Ha <laughs> ha. My uh, some of my residents are delighted. Some, you know, in, in the in the capital of Lionshire in Nimby Town, they're delighted no new houses. What happens then is that if you don't have a plan, a developer can come along and say, we want to build on that site. You say, no, 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 you can't. As the developer, I say, well, you don't have a plan, therefore what's called the presumption in favor of sustainable development applies, I'm definitely going to build there. And if your local planning authority says no, the planning inspectorate will overrule it and I get to build anywhere I want. Now that's in no one's interests because it's a protracted process and expensive, but it does mean that houses eventually get built. That stick, if you like, or uh, that avenue, if you prefer, is still there. All that we've done is to say to local authorities, look, we know that in some cases you will want to say specifically that the green belt is protected and additionally that other areas of environmental or aesthetic value are protected. You can absolutely do that, but um, what you can't do is use that as a way of evading altogether your responsibility to build homes. So we've told the planning inspector and local authorities to take a greater degree of sensitivity towards uh, land of environmental or aesthetic value but local authorities still have to adopt their plans. And those local authorities that haven't adopted plans will, um, will, will, will see those consequences. And again, you know, there are politicians of all colors who are pro-development and politicians of all colors who are um, anti-development. But one of the most striking things is that the local authorities that are and have been most reluctant to adopt plans and most reluctant to speed up planning applications have been the Liberal Democrats. Um, and that's why they had a massive bust up at their conference because their NIMBY councillors and their NIMBY candidates and, uh, and their NIMBY leadership and their NIMBY leadership were confronted by their youthful membership who said, no, we, we, we want to get building. So, so would you wear a t-shirt saying build more bloody houses um, as, as they all were? Uh, we, we don't have one to, to hand. I, should, I, should. Uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, feel the need to add bloody, but yes, we do. <laughs>
We do definitely need to build more houses. Um, the other thing, though, is, uh, uh, as I mentioned earlier, in that argument, I don't think it's good enough just to, to uh, hit people over the head with a target or, indeed, to use the presumption in favour of sustainable development as a get-out. You need to bring people with you. Now, there will, there will be some people who will be resistant to develop and uh, um, anywhere. There are a group of people called bananas build absolutely nothing anywhere near anyone. But uh, I think rather than uh, attempting to, what's the word, uh, uh, force people always into a straitjacket, it's important to make the argument that uh, development enhances the quality of life, and if you've got the right sort of development, then uh, it is something that will be welcomed. And here I've had an argument, not an argument, a discussion with some of the people in the house building sector um, about the importance of embracing uh, uh, quality and beauty. Um, and I think that is a conversation that's moving in the right direction. Um, speaking of which, you, you were reported to have called them a cartel. Do you, do you still uh, stand by that? Or have you, well, have, I, th have I, th I think uh, that was probably, what's the word? Um, uh, I put this. <laughs> uh, uh, shorthand. I, I think now that I have the chance to, uh, uh, expand, to know them a little bit. <laughs> expand the argument slightly, um, actually, the big house builders themselves would say, look, you know, uh, uh, the house building model in this country needs change so that there are more small and medium sized enterprises uh, 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 there. I think they, in fact, I know uh, yeah. that they acknowledge that, but one of the challenges that we've faced is that for a variety of reasons, particularly after 2008, more and more of the, uh, the delivery of homes has come from a limited number of, of house builders. Yeah, and, and fewer bigger sites. Which, which, exactly. And because it's exactly. all more legal, more legal mm. battles to go through. So, one area that we you, you've pinpointed as uh, so, so if I, can, I, I mean I was there in the audience in your speech in July mm. and essentially your argument was rather than build, building a little mm. bit everywhere we mm. should build a lot in a few places yes. and one of the places you you highlighted was, was, was London mm. um, which obviously I uh, you've been banging on about mm. for, for what for ages. You know, there was the, the, you know, uh, in the area around Old Oak Common, or the mm. sort of the vast stretch between um, between Canary Wharf and the uh, and the City of London. There, mm. right, you know, um, uh, or indeed out, out in the east where. Yes. You think. So, what can you actually? Given that the mayor doesn't seem terribly keen on building houses, um, what can you actually do to encourage, facilitate, well, compel that to happen? Um, uh, there are a variety of tools. In extremis, I don't want to do this. Um, I or any other Secretary of State can um, rewrite the London plan. So uh, uh, my experience has been that working with metro mayors of different parties, um, that they understand the argument for development, and uh, the metro mayor who has taken the most pro-house building stance has been Andy Street. He has over-delivered against the, uh, uh, the and, and by the way, interestingly, the Tory vote share in the West Midlands stood up by far the best in the local council. Absolutely. Election. There is a, there is a direct correlation between uh, Andy's success and Ben Houchen's success in Teesside and the resilience of the Conservative vote um, in, in those local elections. Absolutely correct. But in both areas, they have been building houses. A hundred percent. And indeed, in, they, they, would, they would have built even more in Teesside had they resolved the, the nutrient issue, which we may want to touch on in a sec, mm. or may not. Um, the, the, the problem has been that um, uh, the Mayor of London, sometimes I agree with him, often I disagree with him, uh, has uh, uh, been trying to make an argument about social and affordable housing, we certainly need more of that, but he hasn't been uh, uh, able or determined to deliver, and he has the tools to, anything like the number of new homes that London needs. Um, we've been talking to the individual boroughs um, about that, some of, again, some Labour, some Conservative borough leaders are pro-development and want to work with us. I hope that we can get them into a better place through argument and persuasion, and also the provision of infrastructure money in order to provide transport links to clean up formerly industrial land and so on. But if necessary, I reserve the right to, to say um, you're not doing a, uh, uh, your duty, not just by London, but by the country. The plan needs to be rewritten. So I, I will ask about nutrient neutrality next. But, sure. but, there, but there's, I mean, I'm saying this partly because we've done work on it at the CPS, but as well as a top-down version mm. of, of development, there's also a, a bottom-up version. Yes. So, so the, the, the levelling up bill it, mm. um, contains provisions on street votes, for example, yes. but there's also ideas around estate regeneration, mm. around um, um, community, basically trying try to, you know, basically to, to, to let people, to, 
to, to, to let people get more of the benefits of regeneration and therefore vote for it them, themselves? Is that, yes. that presumably something you're attracted totally. to? Totally. So the, 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 um, the principle of street votes um, uh, uh, conceived and incubated um, in the CPS is one that we not, are now... Not, not in, we, we, we're one of many fathers. Well, exactly. So. Um, is, is, is one that we've taken forward and put it in the level of the regeneration bill. And the whole point is it is precisely to allow our community, should it wish to, to add value literally to the householders there by providing um, uh, uh, additional homes and, and, and units and space. Um, and as you also quite rightly point out, um, uh, David Cameron in 2016 argued for and was about to generate a program of estate regeneration. Um, that is something that we want to take forward. There are big challenges because by definition, you are moving people from um, an existing uh, estate uh, while the work of regeneration goes on. Um, it, you know, they, they have to be, people have to be housed, but ultimately it's something that sooner or later is going to have to be done because one of the yeah. problems that we have is that many of the housing estates that were built in the 50s and 60s, while they were built by people who thought of themselves as visionary, were built using materials and in a way that mean that those homes have uh, uh, reached the end of their natural lives. And one of the things that has been most striking um, in the course of the last few years has been the way in which uh, we have had to focus on the quality of social housing. Normally the argument about social and affordable housing has been about numbers, but increasingly thanks to uh, campaigners like Kwaja Twainabur, people have been focusing on damp and mold, dilapidation. And the reason why that occurs is because those buildings haven't been maintained effectively and often because they've been so poorly constructed. So sooner or later, someone's gonna have to do it. I was going to say, estate regeneration tends to get sort of North Korean style majorities. If you mm. guarantee people that they, that they will get a, a, a place at the, yes. at the end of it and they're not just being kicked out. Precisely. And, and it is also the case that, um, as you say, there is, and this is one of the flaws in the London plan, that the mayor has allocated certain areas for industrial and economic activity when the market and people within those communities would rather see housing there. Um, and again, I'm yeah. not entirely sure it, why it's it, it is cheaper to build a big yellow self-storage warehouse yes. than, than housing. Yes. Of the and, and I think that is a mistake because I think that areas around, for example, as you quite rightly point out, Old Oak Common, but Park Royal, there are areas in West London where if the market were operating within, you know, appropriate rules about height, density, design and so on, you would see beautiful new homes being so built rather than commercial boxes. So just go back to the 1894 uh, regulations, strip out everything else away, just, just say, you know, you can, you can, you can build up to, what, up, up to this, a given height, knock yourselves out? Uh, within reason, though I think that some of the design codes and building regulations that we'd have to have would be slightly tighter than when uh, Rosebery was Prime Minister. <laughs> Sorry, uh, so neut neutrality. Um, Mm. A, what, what went wrong and yes. what, what happened, and B, what's going to happen now? Okay. Um, uh, again, I think most people in this audience will, um, will know the argument. So, um, uh, we inherited a legacy EU law, um, uh, the, the nutrient neutrality provisions. Um, and it, it, it existed for a good reason, because um, the Habitats Directive is there in order to ensure that we don't see deterioration in the natural environment. Totally agree with that. Um, and one form of deterioration in the uh, natural environment is when nutrients, nitrates and phosphates, that come from wastewater and farming practices get into our rivers, they create algal bloom. Algal bloom kills wildlife in our rivers. It's a bad thing. We need to deal with it. Um, but the way in which that law had been interpreted following an ECJ judgment had meant, not just in the UK, but in the Netherlands, as you've written about, Rob, there was a total freeze on development, particularly housing development total moratorium in large parts of the country. And that was disproportionate um, because new housing contributes a tiny amount to the nutrient load. And, and in any case, it's not the houses, it's not the bricks and mortar that contribute to the nutrient load, it's us. It's waste water. Wherever we are, we're going to produce it. So our argument was, look, we want to end this moratorium on house building in these affected areas. But we're not negligent about the environmental issues here, quite the opposite. We will devote additional resources, uh, we will legislate, we are legislating, uh, to put new responsibilities on water companies to deal with wastewater, and we will provide support for farmers to change their farming practices so that we no longer have the runoff from fields that goes into our rivers that creates the problem. It's a win-win. Now, 
there were some people who said you should leave this entirely to the market. My view was that we can uh, show leadership by having the taxpayer unlock these sites and develop a market alongside but, but it. But all, all you guys have said was headlines about how Tories love pouring sewage into rivers. Yes, of course. And uh, I, I think you know, there are several reasons for that. Um, uh, and uh, my own view is that, the, as you and the CPS have rightly pointed out, the debate about our rivers um, has been hijacked by campaigners who haven't paid close attention to the facts. Our rivers are cleaner now than they were 13 years ago. We know more about what's happening in our rivers because Richard Bennion, when he was environment minister, wants to be transparent. Um, uh, it is the case that the number of rivers that pass certain EU criteria has fallen because the criteria are much tighter than ever before. Um, but you know, it's been the case that some good-hearted people, but others you know, with a particular agenda, have run this argument. My view is that uh, you shouldn't be put off, even by good-hearted people who are making an argument with which you disagree. You should make your own, we should make our own argument. And I think the thing is that even though we lost the vote in the House of Lords, um, we will win because we're going to take the opportunity, the first available opportunity to bring appropriate legislation, provide the Prime Minister let's be, uh, into the House of Commons in order to, to deal with this situation. So going back to the point about mm. Sadiq Khan, I wanted to talk about something a bit broader, which mm. affects your, your responsibilities. I mean, you, you are sort of in control of or in charge of relationships with, with, with councils. Mm. And what, I mean, the UK is a very, very centralised country, mm. perhaps a very over-centralised country. And one of the things that you get in the head of headlines mm. for is saying, I don't like this housing development, can mm. you please stop it? Yeah. After it's gone, which, mm. after it's gone through all the rules, which mm. gets people a bit annoyed. Or for saying, I, you know, we will take these powers away from mm. Sadiq Khan, or, you know, I mean, the, 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 the striking thing about the Towns Fund announcement today, which mm. is very welcome if anyone hasn't seen it, um, 20 million pounds mm. for lots of houses, lots of investment in buses. But the, the very striking thing was that it said, we will, let count, we will let local areas decide how they spend this money themselves, totally. which doesn't seem to be something that Whitehall is, is very keen on. No, I think um, it is certainly the case that we are an over-centralised country and that we have to move away from that. And if you were to talk to any of my cabinet colleagues, you would find that one of the regular conversations I have with them is about them stepping back and handing more power and resource back to the front line. But I do take an approach towards local government, which is similar to the approach that I took towards schools, which is a greater degree of freedom overall, absolutely, at every level, but also a greater degree of transparency and accountability, which is why we're introducing a new office for local government in order to make sure that meaningful comparisons can be drawn. But if there is failure, then we must intervene. We can't be uh, indifferent when you've got a situation like that which occurred in Birmingham or previously in Slough or Liverpool where local government is failing. On the uh, aesthetic uh, uh, point, um, I think we've used those powers sparingly and I think the, one of the most controversial examples in Kent, we were actually upholding the stated policy of the local authority uh, there. But again, I think there was a particular battle or argument to be had about beauty and housing quality, um, and I'm more than happy to go into the lists on that. But, but on, on the point about councils, are, mm. are they, um, I mean, are, are, are these councils failing because they're badly run or because they've been uh, squeezed dry by, by, the central, by central government? I think in, in almost every case, the former. So again, um, uh, I won't deny that having secured additional funding for local government uh, at the last spending review, helped enormously by the, the then leadership of the LGA, who were very responsible in the way in which they made their case. Not seeing the current leadership isn't, but still, you know, I was really helped there. I, th have, I, I think the then leader is somewhere in the audience. Yeah. But having made that argument and secured that cash, thing, you know, inflation has made things tougher for local government. Undoubtedly, I won't uh, uh, attempt to you know, uh, evade that hard truth, but there are lots of councils that are delivering services effectively without excessive council tax increases. And everyone agrees that if you look at Liverpool, Birmingham, Slough, and sadly also Woking and Thurrock, which were Conservative-led, then mistakes were made that led to these uh, problems. Um, there are many more. So, uh, there, are, there were, until the last set of local elections, more Conservative councillors than Labour council laws, and more Conservative councils than Labour councils. And there are many more Labour councils that have failed than Conservative councils. So, um, uh, I think the problem is more profound 
amongst Labour councils, not restricted to them, you, know, you sometimes find poor leaders in every party. Speaking of um, uh, poor leaders, um, you, you wouldn't in, in endorse the approach of um, trialling a four-day week in a local council when, when you are not. yourself writing a PhD on the effectiveness of the four-day week. I, I know, no, no. I, mean, I, I, I think there is a, uh, a challenge here. Um, people are working incredibly hard in order to make ends meet at the moment. Um, and for people in the public sector to say, do you know what, I'm going to just give you 80% of the service that we used to do, is wrong. Um, and uh, are linked to that, some of the arguments that, as you quite rightly point out, that have been adduced in favour of a four-day week don't stack up. Um, and more broadly, um, you know, <laughs> Where you know, are they in Singapore, in South Korea, uh, uh, in, in Israel, in uh, Texas? Are they saying, do you know what? We should be working less hard, producing less. Uh, we should be less energetic, less determined, less on it. Some kind of global race. Uh, well, you, you, you could see that. You know, the, the, but the thing is that work is ennobling. You know, one of the best things about labor is its name. <laughs> you know, they, 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 you, you shouldn't say, I'm here to serve the public. Oh, look, is it that time? Bye. Um, that is just not um, public service. Um, uh, there's a broader thing as well. Um, during the pandemic, entirely understandably, we recognized how uh, one could work flexibly. There was an argument in the immediate aftermath that flexible working increased productivity. We now know that is, you know, that not the case. Yeah. Um, and, and also, it inhibits social mobility to have people not in the workplace. The way in which you recognize Endeavour, the way in which you provide mentoring and modeling is by having people in the workplace. So my colleague, when he was in government, Jacob Rees-Mogg, was you know, gently mocked for his efforts to get people in. Um, uh, Jacob doesn't mind gentle mockery. He was right. Um, and uh, again, it's, you know, it's absolutely critical that we recognize that um, uh, the, the principle of service means, of course, people should be rewarded well and uh, uh, what's the word? Um, people should be valued for it, but that also means showing up. Yes. I mean, we, we did some work on this when Labour came up with their, mm. their plan and we pointed out that to, to make, you, you, even if you assume there would be the productivity gains that the advocate said there would, yes. it would mean that the productivity gains would go entirely to the workers as opposed to resulting in more effective and cheaper and better value public services. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. So, so uh, we've got half an hour left. Um, I, 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 do, I know there's lots of people who, who want, want to ask some questions, so I will, but I'll just, just move on to sort of broader terrain. Yeah, uh, more broadly, And then and the question is we can get back to housing and um, all the, the stuff that really matters. But the, 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 the situation the party's in is obviously mm. sort of not where it would be, or it could be, or perhaps should be. What do you think, the, I mean, what are the, what are the, what are the chances um, of a Conservative victory in the next election, and what needs to happen to well, deliver that? Um, uh, I'm not very good at predictions. Um, uh, I once wrote a book called Michael Portillo, The Future of the Right. Um, <laughs> if I'd called it Michael Portillo, The Future of uh, Tea Time Television, it would have been uh, more accurate. Um, and also, I once predicted that the Liberal Democrats should be led by Jackie Ballard. She was their savior. Um, I don't know if I asked people here to put their hands up if they remember Jackie Ballard. Many would. That tells you how good I am at making political I, 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 I predictions. I think I can match that with the, the article that, uh, that on uh, Ed, Miliband has, Ed Miliband has lost the election. Clearly, it is Chuck Rimmer's time for... <laughs> so, um, but it, it's a serious point. Um, I think... Um, uh, showing, not telling, is the answer. So uh, we need to demonstrate uh, a record of delivery um, o uh, uh, over the course of the, uh, the next year that some of the investment, some of the steps that we've taken have come to fruition. I would, wouldn't I, argue that we can demonstrate that in education and there is more that we can do there. Um, that, I think, is the most important thing. And I think uh, uh, there will be all sorts of people during this conference and around it, who will have recommendations for forward policy um, on tax and on other areas. 
I understand and sympathise with a lot of the arguments being made, but I think that it's my job in my area to concentrate on showing that we have a plan for housing, a plan for levelling up, that it makes sense in its own terms. And as you've done, you can uh, point out some of the areas where we could and should do better, but I hope that people will realise that there is that uh, clear direction of travel. So, so would you sign a pledge never to, cut, never to raise taxes again? Well, I, I think the pledge is there for backbenchers. Again, I think the key thing is um, for me to sign a pledge would be a bit performative. I'm in the government. I, you know, don't judge me on the pledges I sign, judge me on uh, what we deliver. But you can understand, what, you know, mm. we, we, I've been doing this job for about six years now, yes. I think, uh, and on every, every cabinet minister I've interviewed, every mm. minister I've interviewed, every MP I've interviewed, has solemnly mm. declared themselves to be a low tax conservative, mm. and yet <laughs> we never get low taxes. No, no, and, and there are, well, we did reduce taxes. Um, so, you know, early on, we had, we inherited uh, a grim economic situation. It was the case during the coalition years that we were able to lift the tax burden on, uh, particularly on the poorest. Um, uh, we were hit, everyone knows, by uh, the pandemic and Ukraine. People, sophisticated people like this audience are, I think probably we really familiar with those arguments. But just because people are familiar with those arguments, just because they've heard them, that doesn't uh, 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 undermine the truth of that. We spent an enormous amount of money during the pandemic in order to keep people in work. We were warned that we would have record high uh, levels of unemployment after the pandemic. We didn't. We were warned that, uh, and indeed economic forecasters predicted that we would come out of the pandemic lagging behind France and Germany. We haven't. Um, uh, do we want to reduce taxes in due course? Yes. Uh, we can only do so once we've tackled inflation. Um, the reason why taxes are the level they are is not because Rishi or any of his predecessors have wanted to um, you know, move towards a social democratic future. It's because of the reality of um, uh, the money that we've had to spend um, uh, as I say, principally because of the pandemic, and also a reality of the way in which uh, inflation uh, has proved challenging for lots of public services. So, um, two, two more questions, and then I'll, I'll throw it yeah. to the audience. Um, so, so today, you, you, you may not realize this, but one of my colleagues pointed out um, that today is actually uh, the anniversary of, um, of a, a, a picture of you enthusiastically clapping in the audience mm -hmm. at the Conservative Party conference, which was, I believe, uh, when, a, when a free school had, had been announced. That you were, um, and mm. it, it feels like you mentioned education just then, which is why, mm. why I'm bringing this, this up. You, it feels like this is an area above all, it's, it's an area the Prime Minister is personally passionate mm. about. It's the area the Conservatives actually have a pretty decent track record in. Not least because of your, um, I know, shocking, but mm. um, not least because of your, um, the, the efforts you and, to be fair, the, the Labour government before made in this area. And yet it feels the, the energy's gone out of it, the, the steam has gone out of it. You know, we are still in a, the, the, you know, we are still, you know, the academisation progress has, has stalled, you know, faith schools are, are, you know, are, are quite keen to become academies mm. and no one seems to be gripping it. Like, what, isn't this an area that should be front and centre of the Conservative offering? Instead we just hear about sort of baccalaureates and, and maths lessons. You will be hearing and um, uh, seeing more in days to come. Well, that's fantastic. Um, so, one last question before, before I throw it up into floor, to, to circle back to the side. Is there a job that you haven't done that you would quite like to? Director of the CPS. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, if you want to swap. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think many people might vote for that. <laughs> But not the staff um, of the CPS, I'm sure. No. Um, but so, um, if our, my colleagues with the microphones could go, yep, um, already hands coming up at the front. Uh, this lady here, and then the other lady opposite. Hi, I have a question for the Guardian. Um, when you were talking about the street, you quite anticipated that you would have to make the agreement and the people want to it. According to the Office for Environmental Protection and others, this hasn't happened, and actually, the and it's also been found that we have divergent issues such as chemicals and pesticides. So do you think we are being ambitiously green after Brexit or was that, um, have you not met that goal? I think we are. So let me take one area um, uh, and I can say more about others. Um, 
we took the decision after we left the European Union to change the way in which we supported farmers, to move away, as you know, from payments based on the size of their land holding to payments um, uh, which were related to the environmental benefits that they generated. We were the first country in the world to do that. Others have followed, but we're still the leaders in that respect. Um, I don't think there's anyone uh, who is a concerned environmentalist who would say we want to go back to the old common agricultural policy, land-based payments, um, where uh, dukes uh, take uh, millions from the taxpayer simply because of what their ancestors acquired, rather than people who are genuinely contributing to making sure that we have uh, uh, the hedgerows, the meadows, uh, and the other investments that we require to bring back nature. I think it's also the case that the 25-year environment plan um, shows that in everything from peatland restoration to uh, reforestation, indeed even supporting rewilding in certain areas, that we have and continue to show leadership. Um, I think we are the first and uh, probably the only country to have before 2030 secured 30% of the oceans under our control um, uh, as returned to a pure state of nature. Um, I think it is also the case that some of the uh, legislation that we brought in under the plan for water um, undoubtedly uh, takes us to a, a higher level of environmental rigor than before. Uh, recent changes on net zero still place us very firmly in the European mainstream when it comes to, for example, phasing out the internal combustion engine, but at the same time, we are also showing leadership in energy in all sorts of other areas as well. World leaders in uh, offshore wind um, and also in the, uh, uh, the broader investment that Rishi and Michelle and Claire announced late, uh, last week in developing many of those technologies. So uh, I, I think in the debate on the environment, it's important to look at all of these areas and to recognize that um, well, the argument about the Habitats Directive and nutrient neutrality is important and there are good people on either side. It's only when you uh, pull the, uh, the focus out and look at things in the round, you recognize the changes that we've made. And as I say, many of these changes um, wouldn't have been possible inside the European Union, particularly the changes to farm payments. Hi, uh, Melissa Lawford from The Telegraph. Um, the Conservatives campaigned at the last election uh, with the promise that they would build 300,000 homes a year by the mid-2020s. It's never really come very close to that, and, and we're now at a point where a lot of forecasters are expecting a very, very big drop in house building oh. next year. Uh, so the factors going into that, not least high, in, high interest rates and, and what's happening in the housing market. Uh, what kind of target do you think would actually be realistic for uh, the government to campaign on next year? Well, I think there were two targets in the manifesto. One was uh, to seek to build 300,000 homes a year. The other was to build a million homes over the lifetime of the parliament. Um, and that latter target, uh, we will definitely meet. Uh, uh, Robert and I were discussing a range of things that we need to do in order to improve um, housing supply overall, I think it's only fair to say that in the last full year for which we have figures, there, there was something like 240,000 new homes which were built. You're absolutely right. The biggest impediment to that at the moment has been interest rates and the pressure that puts on mortgages and rents and so on. That's why we have to get interest rates down. Uh, for the future, I think we should continue to show the level of ambition uh, that we've wanted to show in the past. Hello, uh, my name is Claire Bottle and I'm the Chief Executive of the UK Warehousing Association, representing a thousand member companies. When you earlier referred to commercial boxes, I thought I detected a bit of disdain in your voice, but I must be wrong there because your fabulous Minister Baroness Scott, who looks after warehousing, I'm sure will have told you about the social mobility that we deliver in our workplaces uh, and about the use of automation to improve productivity. Um, I'd love to hear the Secretary of State for level up, talk more about logistics. Uh, and with that in mind, my question is about HS2. Would you be able to tell us something about the impact on modal shift and the possibility of moving freight from road to rail? Uh, that 
might come from the cancellation or downgrading of the HS2 project uh, and what that might mean for net zero supply chains, please? Of course. Well, the first thing, and I never thought that I would have to say this, but I do have to say it. I love warehouses. Um, <laughs> And I'm passionate about logistics. Um, but, but just as the, you, we need the right homes in the right places, we need the right warehouses in the right places. And my argument is that in areas where, if, if you had, not entirely the free play market forces, but you had a more market-led approach, then you would have, in our towns and cities, um, more houses built rather than necessarily warehouse space. I believe that would be both economically right and environmentally right. Um, in terms of modal shift. Uh, again, I think that uh, inevitably, when you're thinking about the deployment of freight, uh, you do need to use both road and rail, but obviously the whole point of HS2 is to increase rail capacity in order to ensure that as part of that increased capacity, some of it can be freight. Good afternoon, Michael. Uh, good to see you. Uh, James Jowson, councillor in, in Bedfordshire, and thank you for your kind comments recently. Uh, Chair of the LJ recently stood down. Um, my main comment is you talked about Nimbyshire, <coughs> mm. uh, which I normally call City Hall because it seems every one of our cities mm. are desperately trying not to build houses. Mm. And unlike in the countryside where sustainable development doesn't work because there isn't a farmer's green field, mm. you actually need the City Hall and the mayors to be on your side. So I am very interested in what is it we can do to stop councils and mayors blocking housing when that's desperately needed and I particularly think of levelling up mm. because if we look at the UK cities they are far less dense, they have lots of old council estates that need regenerating and they're the reason that we're not hitting the 300,000, not the rural areas. Yes, I think you're right and I think that, um, it, again, there's no single argument, uh, James, you're absolutely right, however, there are several things that we need to do. The first thing is that central government does have a role to play in providing uh, 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 brownfield and infrastructure funding in order to uh, help to remediate the land, in order to make it commercially viable uh, to develop that housing. Uh, we have to recognise there is a higher cost. We're also changing the way that uh, developers pay for infrastructure in order to further incentivise brownfield development rather than greenfield development. Um, but I think also we need to point to the successes of, I mentioned Andy Street conspicuously earlier, Ben Hatchen, uh, also in mayors who have been keen to see housing development because of the additional benefits that it brings. And in the conversations that we'll be continuing to have with uh, civic leaders in cities, we'll be looking at more and more of the incentives that we can use in order to make sure that they uh, take advantage of these opportunities. But as I say, if it's a really strategic and important city like London, we reserve the right, if the mayor is not doing the right thing, to step in. Not to use up their authority in every area, but because you know, sometimes there are reasons of overriding importance why we need to take a strategic view. Um, uh, thank you, Mike. Uh, William Atkinson, uh, Assistant Editor at Con Home and uh, CapEx contributor whenever Alice lets me. Um, you said right at the start that your, uh, one of your sort of philosophies of government is to think in ink. Oh, yeah, sorry. Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> sorry I was sort of uh, trying to perch the answer. Um, so, yes, you said the importance of uh, thinking in ink. Um, which speech that you've given in or out of government are you most proud of and do you think is perhaps the best reflection of your thinking? Oh, gosh, I don't know, but uh, there's one speech which I think I gave to the Social Market Foundation in which I explained why uh, Jade Goody was my inspiration for education reform. Um, I, I, and, and just to expand on it, um, one of the arguments that's sometimes made about education is, you know, culture of low expectations, you know, and parents can't be really trusted with choice, you know. The point I made is that Jade Goody, sadly deceased, became for a brief period an icon of ignorance. She was on Big Brother. She, you know, didn't know where East Angular was, all the rest of it. It's a rather cruel form of television, Big Brother. Anyway, to Jade Goody's enormous credit, she uh, demonstrated that she could use celebrity in order to, you know, fashion a, a better life for herself. What did she do with her money? What was the first thing she chose to do? To send her children to independent schools. Now, she shouldn't have had to do that because the state school should have been good enough. But the whole point was she wanted the very, very best education for her children. And uh, one of the, the points that I was trying to make is not only 
would she prefer to use her own money to do so? But she knew the type of education that was best. Not private, but education that was academically rigorous. Education where uh, the, the, the subjects that were being taught would give her sons the chance to, if they wanted to, to go to the best universities. And one of the things that has most irritated me is the way in which people, broadly but not exclusively on the left, have said, oh, we need, you know, what kids need at school is, you know, uh, more creativity, you know, teamwork. Uh, if you want to find a fact, you can find it anywhere in the internet and all the rest of it. Really? Okay. Show me what those who really have money and influence do. Do they send their kids to, you know, uh, essentially a teen creche, or do they send them to highly academic institutions with competitive team sports and these sorts of extracurricular activity um, which involve, for example, at Bradfield, putting on a play in ancient uh, Greek or in Latin uh, rather than anything else. Now, the key thing is that um, the, their revealed preference is for the sort of route that gives people choices later. And again, you know, it, 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 this whole argument about rote learning and you know, opposition to it. A, there isn't any rote learning in our schools. But B, if you want to be truly creative as a musician, you don't just turn up, pick up an instrument and freestyle. You will have learned and practiced beforehand before you then become truly creative. So creativity comes from mastery of knowledge and skills in a particular domain. Mozart was creative because he'd spent hours and hours from an early age learning it. So when you get these people talking about, you know, the, you know, let it all hang out, you know, children should discover for themselves, have they ever been to a state school? I, I wonder. And, and, you know, it's absolutely critical that we need to say that um, imposing that vision of education on children from poorer backgrounds holds them back and blunts their opportunities. And Jay Goody knew more about education than many of the people who write about it for our broadsheet newspapers because she knew what the route to opportunity for children from um, difficult backgrounds was. So I think probably my favorite speech was um, the one in which I praised Jade Goody. Um, and if only Jade Goody uh, were uh, still alive, she would be a better uh, spokesperson for education reform than many others. Um, it, 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 would, it, would be, uh, it would be cruel of me to point out that Keir Starmer's education policy is being written by someone who believes all the stuff that Michael uh, was just caricaturing and um, his, his school was recently rated requires improvement. Um, <laughs> can we take a question from the, from the back as we've got to... We've been, Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Eric Costadino from uh, Independent Age. We're an age charity focused on those old people in financial hardship. So a key cohort of those people are older renters. So mm -hmm. quite a simple question is, uh, what was the cause of the delays to the renters' reform bill and when should it be brought back to Parliament? Uh, it, should be, uh, it should have its second reading in the autumn. like me of the NIMBY MPs in the party, such as MPs down in Greater London that try and block, you know, 3,000 uh, flats that are quite a suitable development. What would you say to them, and are you also embarrassed at them? No, I'm not. I think, I think that, uh, again, um, I mentioned earlier uh, that you need to understand why resistance to development occurs and to meet people where they are and try to make it clear that um, uh, there are and will be legitimate concerns about the quality of what's built or about the infrastructure that goes alongside it. Um, and that's why um, in our legislation and in some of the other steps that we've taken, for example, we've established a new body, the Office for Place, in order to try to raise the level of um, aesthetic quality and to embed design codes across um, uh, new development. It's why the, our infrastructure levy is there designed to ensure that more of the, the value that occurs when planning permission is granted goes back to that community. So I think it's wrong to uh, chastise elected representatives 
um, in that way. What we should be doing is making it easier for them to welcome development. Hello there. Uh, yeah, my name is Ellis Holden from the University of York Conservatives. Uh, although I'm originally from Broxport in Hertfordshire, uh, there's an issue that I've been made aware of uh, actually by one of my mum's colleagues regarding uh, somebody who's been put into temporary accommodation because they've unfortunately uh, not, not but been kicked out of their uh, rented accommodation due to a landlord not being wanting to uh, continue renting the property. Um, the one issue about what we've seen is that this woman has been, uh, fortunately, been going to be evicted in the, the start of the year, and it's not really going to basically have much time. And then the letter, it, it says that <coughs> there could be anywhere in the UK, the entire country, uh, where she could be placed. Uh, my, my, my question is, uh, how can you uh, give any guarantee to these people in fortunate situations uh, that they will be, uh, can be placed at least nearby when they exit uh, these, te I guess, temporary accommodations that uh, council set up. Because that, again, uh, being someone who, well, this, this woman has, is a single mother with two kids in primary school, uh, rearranging her life to be uh, across the entire country is obviously a bit of an ask. So I don't know what you could say on that. Thank you. Yeah, no, completely. Without knowing the details of the individual case, and please do, um, uh, contact my office afterwards, let me know, and I'll work with uh, you and uh, this lady's MP. Uh, two things I would say. Um, there was a gentleman earlier who asked about our renters' reform bill. Our renters' reform bill should make that situation far less likely. One of the ways in which landlords, and it's, uh, it's a very small minority of unscrupulous landlords, uh, attempt either to have extortionate rents or to silence people who are complaining about the condition of their properties is to use uh, Section 21, the so-called no-fault eviction power. We're saying that that should go, that certainly landlords should be able to move on tenants if they are, are selling the property, if they're moving a relative in, if there's been antisocial behaviour or rent arrears, but you can't just willy-nilly evict someone uh, because you, you know, for example, want to whack up uh, uh, their rent to a disproportionate level. The second thing is, um, uh, with provision of temporary accommodation, we're providing more money to local government uh, for, uh, to deal with the pressures that exist there. But if you let me know about this specific case, because it sounds like an outlier, but obviously I'd want to get into the detail in order to be able to help. But, Michael, so it, it, it's been reported that many of your parliamentary colleagues and some in, and or some in number 10 are concerned about the renters re reform bill and uh, sort of think it's, think it's gone down the wrong, wrong track. Is that, is that accurate or? No, there are one or two guys on the back benches who are, are very principled property rights uh, thinkers who take a particular... I thought you were going to say very significant landlords. No. No. <laughs> so, um, uh, my friend Chris Chope doesn't like it. He doesn't think that we should interfere with the rights of landlords in this way. I would argue that the relationship between landlord and tenant is different from many other commercial relationships for a variety of reasons. It's not like uh, if, you, if I'm my landlord and you're my tenant, it's not like I am Sky and you are a subscriber to my service and, and so on. It's a different sort of commercial relationship. And throughout history, landlord and tenant law has provided both sides with rights and protections, and this is a modernization of that. But I, I completely respect the view of people who take a very purist uh, position on that, but as I say, um, they are um, uh, some people on the back benches, and it's not the view of the government. Hi, I'm Mr. Gold. Oh, so, 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 sorry, <laughs> oh, never mind. Uh, I know, if, if you go in, no, no, yeah, carry on. So, the, the other guy, um, after the, the curse of having two microphones. <laughs> sorry about that, um, Mr. Gold. Uh, with all the discussion about house building in terms of uh, doing away with old EU legislation and um, mm. conflicts with council stuff like that, isn't at least part of this in vain, given the fact that while we're discussing all of this, net migration is still reaching unprecedented levels, which is um, putting a huge um, um, strain on the demand for housing, which according to the Telegraph could, in terms of net migration, could reach over one million for the first time. Well, I don't think it will reach a, a million in any given year. I think that if you look at the most recent year for which we have figures, one of the reasons why the figures were so high is because of the people whom we welcome from Ukraine, Hong Kong, and Afghanistan. Um, and uh, so uh, I don't know about that. The people in particular from Ukraine will, again we pray, be going back to Ukraine 
in due course. Uh, uh, people from Afghanistan and Hong Kong will be settling here permanently. Yes, it is the case that migration places pressure on housing, but it's also the case that we are providing support for local councils to build or acquire additional homes in order to take account of, of that pressure. And uh, my own view is that um, a, a responsible government will always need to, A, welcome economic migration of people who meet certain thresholds and criteria, B, open as we are to uh, people of exceptional ability do want to come here and study, and then C, we'll always need to be able to offer uh, refuge to those who are fleeing persecution of a particular number. And, and our capacity to do all of those three depends on people being confident that we can control migration overall, particularly illegal migration. And I actually think that is not just where the majority of the British public are, I think that is a sensible view that most politicians in this country understand instinctively. And to be fair, that's the view of, as far as I know, anyone entrusted with the leadership of a liberal democracy anywhere in the world. But my, so, so, I mean, mm. we, if, if, if you look at the polling on, I mean, everyone, people do accept we have a housing crisis, mm. but the number one cause they ascribe to it is too many immigrants, and the number one thing they say we, we could do to not have a housing crisis would be to, to cut the number of mm. migrants. So it, it clearly feeds into the, the housing crisis. Yes, it does, it does. And I, and I think, um, uh, it, it, as I say, last year was exceptional in terms of numbers for a variety of reasons. Um, we do need to sh demonstrate, and Sue Ella has, by, for example, taking some steps to um, limit the way in which dependence of people who've come in here to study, or ostensibly to study, can come here. Um, but uh, it's about striking a balance, and striking that balance means bringing those numbers down to a controllable level, but having a conversation with the country um, about where those numbers uh, uh, might rest. And you know, one of the things that I find odd is that um, uh, People criticise the efforts that Suella and before her Pretty and before her Theresa um, undertook in order to, to manage migration into this country and to deal with illegal migration. So I might, might disagree with you know, individual policies at any given point, that's fair enough. But what is the alternative view? So for people who are very critical of Suella, do they believe that migration into this country should be higher, significantly higher? Um, when Yvette Cooper, good debater, makes her points, she never says, you're being too restrictionist in terms of numbers, we want many more people to come here. She'll argue about the efficacy of the means by which Suella and others are dealing with um, the small boats crisis. But, um, uh, <clears throat> you know, I, I think that some of the, what's the word, uh, criticism that's deployed towards anyone who has responsibility for policing our borders is, uh, it, it, it comes from a place of, of not being honest about the difficulties and the trade-offs. So we, we, we're out of time, but I did cut that guy off before, so just very, very quickly. And, yeah. Very quick question. Ben Beale, Chief Executive of the National Residential Landlords Association. I don't think we're purists. I think we're pragmatists. So maybe, do you believe that a thriving private rented sector uh, where landlords have the confidence to provide decent homes is important for the future of housing provision. Yes, and, and the point that I would make then is that, to be fair, the National Residential Landlords Association and other representative bodies have always argued for uh, a, a balanced market in which there is appropriate protection for tenants. Um, uh, and actually, the overwhelming majority of landlords um, want a relationship with their tenants where the tenants stay. Easily the best thing is to have a long-term relationship with someone who pays the rent, looks after the property, um, and where there are um, you know, those, 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 those ties. Obviously, within the rental market, you need to take account of, uh, of movement, particularly amongst students and so on. One of the things, again, the NRILA uh, has helpfully pointed out to us is that if we want to keep rents reasonable, we have to take a staged approach towards the energy improvement that we both want to see. Um, my point was simply that there are uh, some, uh, 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 some guys in my party who are free market purists uh, who would 
prefer even less regulation than you and I would. That's fair enough, it's a good philosophical point of view. It's important to have people like that in a party because sometimes they can remind you of principles that you need to pay heed to. On this occasion, I respectfully disagree with them. But yeah, absolutely, you, know, the, the, you can't have an effective housing market or provision of the homes that we need without having a variety of different types of tenure. <coughs> um, a route to home ownership, uh, a private rented sector that facilitates labour mobility, um, among other things, and socially rented homes uh, in order to help people who are, uh, for whatever reason, uh, 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 eligible for and deserving of that level of support. So, you know, you need all different elements within the mix. Well, Michael's already done uh, one part of my job here, which is to urge you all to sign up for the CapEx newsletter. Uh, but the other part is to say, um, please uh, follow the CPS and CapEx on every single form of social media going. Please come back to our area for an exciting program of events uh, throughout the conference. Next up is me and various others talking about whether the centre-right can survive both in the UK and, and more broadly. Uh, Michael will be on the main stage tomorrow, I think. Uh, for Tuesday. Tuesday. Tuesday uh, yes. For, I think. But um, is the, um, the main thing I need to do is thank you so much to Michael Gove.